a song for black lives. He was another young man, cut down in his prime. He wasn't going anywhere, he wasn't doing any crime. But his skin was black, they didn't wait to see. He never had a gun, they shot him dead in the street. Put on your walking shoes. Join in and march for change These walls we've erected will surely come down And love will win again She was a black woman driving through the wrong part of town He pulled her over and he dragged her out He said I'll light you up and hauled her away They threw her into prison, she was dead in three days Put on your walking shoes Join in and march for change These walls we've erected will surely come down And love will win again We are citizens together, we are clergy, police We're from every religion and from every race We've seen too many die, their lives too cheap Justice and equality our promises will keep Put on your walking shoes Join in and march for change These walls we've erected will surely come down And love will win again From Ferguson, Missouri to the streets of L.A. For Trayvon Martin and for Freddie Gray For Tamir and Sandra and Michael Brown We say that black lives matter We will not be shut down Put on your walking shoes Join in and march for change These walls we've erected will surely come down And love will win Put on your walking shoes Join in and march for change These walls we've erected will surely come down And love will win again Greetings and welcome to Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation. To our members, friends, and everyone joining us in our virtual congregation on YouTube today. I'm the Reverend Robin Landerman Zucker, minister of this congregation, and I will be hosting our service today for June 7th, 2020, with our music director, Gabriel Hernandez, and our accompanist, Rebecca Prisnick. I'm also grateful for the contributions of my colleague, the Reverend Dan Schatz, and the Chester Children's Chorus, who you will hear later in the service. This congregation is spiritually open and intentionally inclusive. Whoever you are and whomever you love, you are welcome here. Our members and friends bring many interests, theologies, and viewpoints. Here we trust that you will find a common desire for meaningful community and spiritual growth and a path for relevant religious exploration. Membership in this congregation is open to anyone who chooses to walk with us in the spirit of love and a genuine open search for truth. As I light the chalice, the symbol of our free faith, Please light your own chalice or candle at home and recite with me the unison words that appear on your screen. We light this chalice with a flame that brings us together. With this flame, we cut through the darkness of isolation and are warmed by the fires of our interconnection. This is a service today in which we're addressing a serious and challenging topic, allyship to people of color. It comes on top of our continued weariness and concern about the COVID-19 virus and how it has forced us to be out of physical contact with one another. Today in our service, we have poems, 
and music, and a sermon, and images, to bring us to a place where we can together face, consider, reflect on, and then work together for real change in the world where we side with love. One of our slogans is Unitarian Universalists. So we begin with opening words, a poem by Lucille Clifton that was written in 1992 after the beating of Rodney King, which reminds us just how long, just how long the struggle has gone on to make Black Lives Matter. Gabe? For Rodney King by Lucille Clifton. So, the body of one black man is rag and stone, is mud and blood. The body of one black man contains no life worth loving. So the body of one black man is nobody. Mama, mama, mamacita, is there no value in this skin? Mama, mama, if we are nothing, why should we spare the neighborhood? Mama, mama, who will be next? And why should we save the pictures? Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us imprisoned, circle for release, circle for the planet, circle for each soul. For the children of our children, keep the circle whole. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us in prison. Circle for children of our children keep the circle please join me in reciting the mission and covenant of beacon the mission of beacon unitarian universalist congregation is to be a welcoming community that embraces diverse thought belief and builds a just and compassionate world Love is the spirit of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity and kindness. Thus do we covenant. Thank you. Now is the time in our service when members of our community are invited to share a personal joy or sorrow in the supportive fellowship of this community. I didn't receive any specific joys and sorrows this week, but there are certainly plenty to go around that we share. There are certainly many joys in the world. This past week, we've witnessed many sorrows. Again, the continued mourning around our country for the death of George Floyd and before him, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, and so many others, and how People who care about this have taken to the streets and have dealt with both solidarity and violence. So this is, I think, something to celebrate, to see how much people are moved, but also a sorrow to see the difficulties and the violence that has also ensued in the wake of that activism. Certainly for the families of George Floyd and all of those who have been affected directly, by police brutality, excessive force, racism. This is just a meager stone.
for all of us who continue to be concerned about the COVID-19 virus, those who have been affected by it directly in their families and caregivers, those who are mourning the deaths of those lost to the virus, this is for them. This is stone of hope that we soon have a vaccine and we can move past this time and into a period of health. And another stone of hope that we will move into a place of healing and power and clarity around the systemic difficulties and challenges we face in America. For all the joys and sorrows that remain unspoken because they are either too private or too tender to share, I drop this stone. Let us remember that everyone is fighting their own private battle. We may not know what it is, but because we're human, we know it to be true. So let us be kind, compassionate, flexible, and forgiving with one another. Now I invite you to come into a comfortable position in a chair with your feet on the floor and your arms uncrossed and to just close your eyes and breathe. Breathing has become a subject foremost in the hearts and minds of our world. I can breathe. I can't breathe. Black people in this country saying, I can't breathe. People with COVID-19 saying, I can't breathe. A disproportionate number of them, African-American. So let's show gratitude for the fact that we can in fact breathe by intentionally breathing. We'll breathe in four beats through your nose and breathe out four beats through your mouth in a steady stream. So let's just breathe. Feel where the breath opens you up when you breathe intentionally, clearing your mind, opening your heart, relaxing your body, possibly opening your throat so you can speak important words, opening your mind to new thoughts, strengthening your body, for resolve, for marching, for protesting, for the journey ahead. Just breathe. Breathe and allow. Feel gratitude for the breath. I can breathe. As you breathe, I offer part of a poem written by an online poet on a poetry slam site. His name is Feel My Words. And this is an excerpt from his poem, I Can't Breathe. Breathe, breathe in the hate, the negativity, the emptiness, breathe out the greatness that we are and will always be. Hope for those that don't know it yet. Strength for those taking chances and standing up. Love for our brothers and sisters. Love for our enemies. Breathe in and breathe out for those who have suffered for those who can't, for those whose last words echo in our heads. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Let us breathe and be silent together.
Blessed be. Dear Mr. Floyd by Kate Tucker. In pandemic times, we learn that breath is everything. See what we'll risk to keep it flowing in and out of our lungs, to feel it cool the nostrils, to feel our breastbone rise, to trust how it finds its way and feeds the blood. In pandemic times, we see how the world goes to work for a simple breath giving up livelihoods, bringing children home from schools, all to protect this elementary act. See the nurses in shields like warriors. See the mask makers intent at their sewing machines over scraps of fabric. See the factories retool to make machines that push air through our windpipe so that we may sing the song of life. See distilleries turn spirits into sanitizer to make our hands clean. But our hands are not clean, Mr. Floyd, because of the other virus. The contaminant, which is our pre-existing condition that causes us to step away from each other for centuries. Now your town is on fire and you lie still on the pavement. See how our tears fall on our masks. See how our masks fall from our faces. See the fabric unravel, Mr. Floyd. Rise, please rise like this smoke. Do not refuse to haunt us. For how will we remember what we learn and forget? Breath is not cheap. Our sermon today is entitled, We Will Make Them Feel Us on Allyship to People of Color. If they refuse to hear us, we will make them feel us, wrote Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's mother, in an open letter to Michael Brown's family after he was shot in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. Some will mistake that last statement as being negatively provocative, Ms. Fulton remarked, but feeling us means feeling our pain, imagining our plight as parents of dead children. We will no longer be ignored. This morning, I am going to do what I can to feel them and to help you do the same. It's uncomfortable, but that's part of the process. 
In truth, I have given sermons shockingly similar to this in the past 10 years. The same grim statistics, the same call to action, and what have I truly done since? Crafting this sermon has been especially challenging because it has left me nowhere to hide as I reckon with myself, ponder the meaning of solidarity, how to minister through this time authentically, and examine the difference between well-meaning support and truly conscious allyship behavior as a white person in America. As a minister in this denomination, I was asked to join a nationwide effort called the White Supremacy Teach-In in 2017. Beacon was one of the participants too. When I heard this term applied to us, I winced and resisted, but I've learned since why the organizers chose that verbiage. Am I a white supremacist? As organizers of the 2017 teach-in suggest, are you white supremacists? Egads! That term conjures up images of lynching, lynchings and robed Klansmen and men in Hawaiian shirts and automatic weapons getting ready for the boogaloo. But here's the definition that helped me understand. White supremacy is the water we swim around in without even realizing we're wet. The Black Lives UU Steering Committee assumed leadership of this effort as they should and have also crafted an eighth principle to be considered by delegates at the General Assembly, possibly this year. It reads, we the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Now to be clear, I have no interest in making you feel bad or making myself feel bad either because that's really not going to do any good. But I'm not willing to coddle us either or ignore white fragility or white privilege or that water we swim around in without realizing we're wet. Compassion for self is a prerequisite for deep awareness and change. I'm not here to blame you or shame you or lecture you or scold you from some higher, holier than thou bully pulpit. I wasn't even sure I wanted to join that white supremacy teaching in 2017. But here we are, and I have no regrets. And I ask for your presence, if not your full agreement, here in our virtual sanctuary today, this day in the wake of so much pain and violence and action around racism in America. I am not an expert. If I tried to pass myself off as woke, I would fall far and flat right on my face. I'm getting there. My objective is actually quite the opposite. I realize I'm one of those well-intentioned liberal white people I've been reading about who hasn't been quite sure what solidarity looks like to people of color. I've been bewildered as I've immersed myself in blogs and articles and opinion pieces and Facebook posts from just about every angle for years now, but especially since George Floyd was killed on that Minnesota street, followed, following in depressingly short order, most recently by the deaths of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey. Since 2017, I have sought out dialogue with African-American friends and colleagues who were willing to listen to my confusion and questions without labeling, 
dismissiveness, or contempt. And I'll tell you, I've learned a lot these past few weeks about the crucial importance of intersectionality in justice work. I recall reading a fierce blog several years ago, admonishing white people to stay away from a Black Lives Matter march. Only people of color were welcome. This baffled me until I was made right-sized by a friend who went on to note that there were plenty of marches and groups and protests and vigils to be part of, including UU congregations throughout the country who are forming their own groups. And in some cases, the protesters are all white and that's fine. And if people of color want to march by themselves, who are we to say they can't? Remember that. They don't owe us a place in the march. All we need to do is decide we're gonna pick a corner and show up. You can find links for Black Lives Matter events, protests, marches, initiatives, right here in Flagstaff, on Facebook and on the internet. Hundreds of people have been peacefully gathering and protesting in this mountain town for the past week. While I'm preaching this sermon to you, they're gathering in front of the city hall and you can choose to join them or join whatever group is in the town or city that you are watching this from. You can read and ponder and importantly, locate yourself in the system and get right-sized. I've gleaned some valuable insights from several thought-provoking, consciousness-raising articles and blogs with titles that have an increasingly kind of poke in the eye provocativeness. In particular, the comments of the blogger Ryan Dalton on his page, Thoughts of Brown, a piece entitled, Tapes of White People Who Comment on Black Experience and Pain. I took a deep breath. What follows, if what follows makes you uncomfortable, then we will be uncomfortable together. It's the beginning because the only way out is through. Dalton is a perceptive and talented writer who doesn't pull any punches. He starts in the cesspool with overtly racist people overtly racist white people, no explanation needed. We can picture those people, hear those people. But then he moves on to white privilege apologists who begin sentences with, I'm not a racist, but, and express ideals of colorblindness and pseudo equality. We're all the same. Everyone can succeed in America. I don't see color. A discourse that is far removed from reality and shows the white privilege of not having to see color in your own life. As Dalton ventures into the last two categories, well-meaning white people and conscious white people, I begin to feel an odd prickly sensation all over my conscience. And I feel like I might have a sudden onslaught of consciousness hives. Why? Because, well, I wanna find myself in the most enlightened category, of course, and Unitarian Universalists like myself like to place themselves there without much self-interrogation. About well-meaning white people, Dalton says, most well-meaning white people will admit that racism and white privilege exist and is a problem, but aren't fully aware of how to address it in reality. Some well-meaning white people embody what he calls the white savior industrial complex, which whether intentional or not, positions white people in the place of the savior or of, of often poor black people. And this is often found in the white church, in missionaries, some white teachers in urban schools. In situations like the death of George Floyd, the murder, of George Floyd. Well-meaning white people usually try to speak out against the injustice, but sometimes overstep their bounds. 
I'm relieved that he notes the good intentions there. And I recognize my own muddled thinking about how to demonstrate solidarity in that description. In some ways that has sounded like me in the past, and I want to own that in order to transform it. It's a steep learning curve for me and possibly for you too. So many rocks to trip on, on the inclining path. Yet I'm reminded by the Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber that white guilt does nothing. It just makes us look for exoneration. White guilt leads to changes of only optics of which people are, of color are the object, not the subject. She says, this leads me to figure out how to alleviate my white guilt. And once again, it centers my white feelings, my whiteness. My colleague, the Reverend Meg Riley, at one point the head of social justice advocacy for us in Washington, DC, she admits to her own bumbling in a piece called, what do we do when we don't know what to do? I don't know about you, she writes, but Times of not knowing aren't my favorite. As a white person, I am used to feeling in charge. I like to feel well-informed and smart. And it's particularly unsettling to realize anew almost every day how deep my unknowing goes. Some days I walk around feeling pretty smart, as white people generally do, and then I hear a story like the ones African Americans have been telling these past weeks, and I am stopped in my tracks, recognizing anew how totally and completely I will never know their experience, never know anything but my own white privileged experience. No matter how big my heart is, and my compassion, or my intentions, I We'll never know. But the gift of not knowing, says Riley, quite sagely, of knowing we don't know can motivate us to learn. Maybe in our time of unknowing, we who are white can realize that we should not try to be in charge for a change, that we should support the leadership of people of color, even if we don't agree with their leadership approach. They are the experts of their own experience. They need to be the experts in the movement. Maybe we can try to take a few steps forward together. I don't know what will happen, but I'm willing and ready to enter a new day. Like Meg, perhaps like some of you, I am ready to enter a new day and commit myself to moving up to the highest rung on Dalton's scale of white people, conscious white person. I am partially there, and perhaps you are partially there, but I am nowhere near the mountaintop. Here's what Dalton has to say. Conscious white people actually get it as much as a white person can. They are aware of the various degrees of racism within us all and within our society. They have committed to going through the continuous process of acknowledging their own privilege and checking their own prejudices and biases. Most of this category's knowledge of the Black experience is based in authentic, loving relationships with people of color, spending time with them, listening and learning from the actual voices living the Black experience also aware that no one individual is an icon that represents an entire race of people. In the situation of the deaths of unarmed black men like George Floyd, Philandro Castile, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, women like Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Conscious white people are committed to seeking justice, actively calling out systemic racism. They value and validate in a way that is not patronizing the voices of people of color and allow them to determine the trajectory of the narrative. 
and they realize that white on black racism is not a black problem. It is a white problem. That's a conscious white person. I'll add that a conscious white person or a conscious white person in training will examine the discomfort, maybe even the resentment they feel when they read this proposed eighth principle. They may challenge or push back Black Lives Matter by asserting, yes, all lives matter. The thing is, all lives matter, but right now we are talking about why Black Lives Matter. One African-American preacher lifted up a passage from Luke 15 to explain. He points out that there were 100 sheep and 99 of them were safe, but one of them was missing. So Jesus goes after the one who's lost. Nobody asks, all offended, well, what about the 99? Because it's the one that's lost. Well, we're on this subject. Black lives matter doesn't suggest that white lives don't matter. White privilege isn't some sort of scarlet A. But let's be clear that the color of our white skin doesn't make it harder for us just to be living on the planet every minute of every day. It means that you don't have to give even a fleeting thought to the rules parents teach their black sons living in America, such as never leave home without an ID. Don't wear a white tank top, also known as a wife beater in public. Do not loiter on the street or even stand outside to make a phone call. Do not play loud music from your car. Never stare at a white woman. Do not touch anything you are not going to buy. Always have a receipt when you leave a store. Or to live like a man named Sean Drumgoole, the African-American man who expressed fear about taking a walk in his increasingly gentrified neighborhood. He shared his fear on Nextdoor, a local website you might be familiar with, and more than 75 of his neighbors of all races and ages, they walked with him heartwarming? Yes. But honestly, can you even imagine having to catalog and review those rules or check those fears in order to just get through the day alive? Ponder it. Can you feel it? Can you feel them? And our comfort doesn't matter more than Black lives. In his searing book, Tears We Cannot Stop, a sermon to white America, Michael Eric Dyson cites knee-jerk responses to the Black Lives Matter movement as a key example of what he calls white willful denial. He preaches, when black folks say black lives matter, they are in search of a simple recognition that they are decent human beings, that they aren't likely to commit crimes, that they're reasonably smart, that they are no more evil than the next person, that they're willing to work hard to get ahead, that they love their kids and want them to do better than they did, that they are loving and kind and compassionate, and that they should be treated with the same respect that the average, nondescript, unexceptional white person routinely receives without any fanfare or the expectation of gratitude in return. As for Black Lives Matter banners, the cause of so much hand-wringing amongst even the most self-identified progressives, I have seen people leave Unitarian Universalist churches over the fact that they did not want a Black Lives Matter banner outside our building. I wonder where they stand now. Yes, these banners have been defaced and replaced and hung higher and bigger and prouder at many of our churches around the country and certainly many places around the country. 
We haven't cornered the market on progressiveness and anti-racism work in the religious world. In fact, we're behind some denominations, regardless of how much we feel that we are the activists in the arena. But because so many UU churches have had the courage to put up banners, repair them when they were defaced, hang them higher, they're finding that they are actually attracting new members who recognize that commitment, courage, and solidarity lives within that congregation. I wonder if we will join them. As far as the pathway to becoming a conscious white person, the element that really jumps out at me is the action of listening and learning in authentic relationships, or slightly rephrased in empathic relationships, one in which we attempt to feel one another the way Sabrina Fulton describes it in her open letter. If they will not hear us, we will make them feel us. Do you have any friends who are people of color? If so, turn to them, listen to them, feel them, feel. Developing empathy is an essential component to demonstrating appropriate solidarity in all relationships and encounters and a key component for social justice. When we cultivate genuine empathy and can be truly present to another person's suffering, radical connections can be built and barriers transcended that might have otherwise seemed impassable. And then, as conscious white folk, we need to flex our privilege as respectful but reliable allies. To cover all aspects of allyship here today in front of you, we need to be in church all day, like the early Unitarians, breaking for lunch at the tavern across the green. But no fears, we're not going to do that. This sermon is a call to more, to deeper, to engagement. I've left you plenty of breadcrumbs to do the work on our website, in our e-news. No one will do this work for you. No one should do this work for you, not me, and least of all, a person of color. Our website has a growing list of resources, such as the downloadable 75 Things White People Can Do for Racial Justice and a Guide to Allyship. I'm inviting you to read with me and study the best-selling book, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. There are YouTube talks and blogs aplenty and excellent learning materials that we can engage in together. And I hope we will, including a webinar series called White Privilege, Let's Talk, a resource for transformative dialogue that was created by the United Church of Christ, the same group that created the Our Whole Lives Sexuality Program with us. Look for notices and links in the E! News, on the Facebook page, and other communication channels at Beacon. And so very crucially, we can vote and apply pressure to local leaders to reform the role of police unions in setting rules for discipline and dismissal. There is a great website that I recently saw that you can view. It's called Eight Can't Wait which calls on police departments to do the following eight things. Ban chokeholds and strangleholds, require de-escalation, require warning before shooting, exhaust all other means before shooting, ban shooting at moving vehicles, require the use of a force continuum, and require comprehensive reporting. Like me, you might wonder with some astonishment and horror how these eight things are not already required or expected. And as we know, people of color are at the receiving end of chokeholds 
and trigger finger shootings and rapid escalations to a horrifying degree. That is why they are marching in the streets all across the world and why white people are marching with them. We must do better. These places of social inquiry, they are uncomfortable, but they also act as crucibles for self-growth and for reaching out to others without any sense of paternalism or privilege. Radical connection requires that we be self-critical about our roles in perpetuating any process that causes harm to others. And we need to bear witness to the trauma that comes in its wake. The key is to let the other person define that suffering and pain as we stand as allies and take an appropriate role in the struggle. Will we call each other in rather than call each other out in a cancel culture? Will we stick around as allies once the dust settles yet again? Once the news cycle moves on from George Floyd and the protesters that said his name, can we, will we tie our very nerve endings to the plight of people of color in our country? I believe that if we can internalize this notion of empathy, humility, and inquiry from a foundation of solidarity and radical connections, the next time we are asked by a member of an oppressed or marginalized group, whether they made us feel them, the answer will be, yes, you did. I am opening my eyes and my heart. Now, what can I do to show you and demonstrate strength in unity as you lead me and we fly up? all together. So may we rise, be brave. Amen. Hello, please join me in singing Come and Go With Me. that land come and go with me to that land come and go with me to that land where i'm bound come and go with me to that land come and go with me to that land come and go with me to that land where i'm bound there'll be a freedom that land there'll be freedom in that land there'll be a freedom in that land where i'm bound where i'm bound there'll be freedom in that land there'll be freedom in that land there'll be freedom in that land where i'm bound there'll be justice in that land justice in that land there'll be justice in that land where i'm bound there'll be justice in that land there'll be justice in that land there'll be justice in that land where i'm bound thank you Each week, whether we are together in the sanctuary or we are together here virtually in our YouTube sanctuary, we collect an offering for our community, for Beacon, and for our community partners. We so appreciate your donations, especially during this time that we are not together. You can make a secure donation on our website, beaconuu.com, using the Venko application, or you can send a check to Beacon at our Flagstaff address with offering in the note. I also encourage you to look at the organizations 
that are on our website, yeah, organizations you can find pretty much everywhere, Black Lives Matter, A Can't Wait, the ACLU, you take your pick and think about whether you might want to contribute independently to one of those organizations. And we thank you for your generous donation now and in the future. Finally, I encourage you to come together like we do in the sanctuary, holding hands and imagine us holding hands and being in community. As we've been saying, we are beacon, always connected, whether we are together or apart. I am here for you, so please reach out to me. And remember that even though our building is closed, our beloved community is never closed. Well, we imagine ourselves in community. Gabe has some closing words for us. Be well. Blessed be. Blessed we. Amen. If We Must Die by Claude McKay. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, And for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men will face the murderous, cowardly pack, Pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back.
Thank you.